Lord, we thank you so much for giving us a Sabbath day and for the day that we can come together, fellowship with you specifically and each other and the church that you've given us, Lord. Not just this little church in the country, but your wider church, uh, all of God's people. We just thank you for that too. And right now, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us as we study your word. Please be with my teaching as we uh, delve into scripture here specifically today. And also forgive our sins. We want to come before your presence with nothing between us. So thank you, Lord, for answering these prayers when we ask. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Title of our lesson, week's lesson, is Jerusalem Controversies. The memory verse comes from Mark 11:25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. They used a big word in Sabbath afternoon study. I had to look it up. Polemical. <laughs> Did you see that? Uh, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem and they're talking about he's getting into political situations or polemical situations which are a critical attack. He's headed to Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen. He has now told his disciples three times exactly what's going to happen. Peter's even rebuked him for it on one of those occasions. I think it was the third. And last week, we ended their journey in Jericho. Remember Jericho, where he heals blind Bartimaeus, unless you're in Matthew, where he heals two blind people? It's one or the other, maybe both. <laughs> and they head to Jerusalem from Jericho. I couldn't help but remember a journey on that same road from Jerusalem to Jericho written about in scripture, Jesus talks about the story where someone is injured by robbers and three people pass him by. Well, two people pass him by and finally a Gentile helps a Jewish brother. That's this road that they're traveling. I was trying to look it up this morning about how far it is. Uh, Lisa finally helped me out. 18 miles, the old city of Jerusalem to the old city of Jericho. In their case, Jericho to Jerusalem. It's still 18 miles, but, <laughs> but it's uphill. Jerusalem's on a hill. They tell us uh, in our lesson that it's actually located about 2,400 feet above sea level. Jericho is down by the river. It's much lower. And so it's uphill. 18 miles. So on Sunday, and this is Sunday of the crucifixion week, they head from Jericho after this healing toward Jerusalem. And as you can imagine, it takes a while to travel 18 miles uphill. So when they get to well, Bethany or Bethphage, however you say that second uh, little town that's there. I don't think so. I, I think they are two different towns, actually. Do you think they're the same ones? Mm -hmm. I, they are. They're two different towns. When they get there, it's late in the afternoon. But Jesus still has something that he wants to do. Take your Bibles. We're in Mark 11 today and 12. So go to Mark 11 one. And we're going to do quite a bit of reading today because these stories are so beautiful and they're so concise that I can't tell them to you better than John Mark tells Peter's version of these stories. Are you there? Mark 11.1, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, 
they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany. And who lived in Bethany? That's it. On the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Now it's interesting, if you skip over to the book of Matthew and read the same story, it appears that they are in uh, Bethany. Now this is not uh, biblical, it's not, not uh, even something that matters that much, but I suspect that the reason that they tell us about the second town, Bethphage, is there in Bethany, according to Matthew. And they go to Bethphage to get the, the little colt. Yeah, words it, I was just to say, the way it words it here, it sounds like that. Right. Go into that village over there. Over there. So that's perhaps why they, why they give both names here. Can't tell you for sure. Anyway, he gives us instructions. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Now, some of you like horses. Have you ever tried riding a horse that's never been ridden uh, before? <laughs> Paula just says, yeah, and that's it. So, Paula, what did happen? Well, uh, well mostly I, it was at Phyllis's place, you know, when I first moved here. So, if the horse was used to you and you get on its back, it was just like shocked. You know, like, what are you doing on my back? But if the horse didn't know you, it could be a whole other story. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, if you had like a relationship. My experience with horses, my dad had horses. He loved horses. He wished I would love horses. I didn't love horses. I felt like there was just way too tiny a brain in there for all that horsepower. <laughs> anyway, my usual uh, horse riding ended up with me on the ground. <laughs> but I know, and I had a relationship with this horse. Maybe it was a bad relationship, but anyway, <laughs> a relationship. <laughs> It, it, it had a few bad habits, you know, it kicked. Occasionally it would try to buck a little bit and it would bite. But other than that, it was pretty nice. <laughs> anyway, this caught my attention. One that no one has ever ridden, untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it. And we'll return it soon. The disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. I couldn't help but remind you this is an unbroken colt because... He sits on it. There's no mention of it resisting, bucking. Now we had donkeys too. My dad went through a donkey phase. Those are very stubborn, disagreeable animals. <laughs> and this is not a mule, this is a donkey. Anyway, just going on. Now, when they asked for this colt, something must have happened. Because the very next verse here, Mark 11, 8, many in the crowd, so obviously when they took the colt, people were like, what's happening here? And a crowd gathers. Now I don't know how big a crowd could be in Bethphage or Bethany, wherever they're at at this point, but the crowd gathers. Uh, uh, not only have the disciples put their garments on, on the colt, but now the crowd is spreading their garments in front of the little colt. 
I can tell you what would have happened to my garment if I would have had it there, just with my relationship with horses and donkeys. Mine would have been the one with I would have needed to wash thoroughly. And others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession and, all, and the, the people all around him were shouting, praise God or Hosanna. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. I'm going to switch this over to the NIV here. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now we've got to unwrap some of this, but we'll finish here with 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem went to the temple, remember that? He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, they've already walked 18 miles, now they've done this processional. He went out to Bethany with the 12. So he makes the trip from Jericho, does the triumphal entry, they didn't call it that, but we're calling it that. He looks at the temple and goes back to Bethany. We don't know if he's staying with Lazarus and company, but he's at least in their town. Now, what do you find in here that catches your attention? Why, let me ask you a question, why are they talking about the kingdom of our father, David? Anybody want to answer that? There's a prophecy. Do you happen to know which prophecy? Zechariah. Uh, yeah, let's read that one. Uh, Zechariah 9.9. 9. We'll see if we find that phrase in there. And by the way, you get an A for knowing where that is. <laughs> it's very good. That's, that's good enough there, Joe. Did you find that phrase, son of David, in this prophecy? Not in this prophecy. But it's still a significant prophecy because it tells the people of Israel how their king's going to come. Riding on a donkey. Let's talk about that for a minute. How did kings, especially conquering kings, how did they enter a city? On a donkey? No. On a war horse. A war horse or maybe a chariot. They wanted to show force and power. But this king is predicted to be gentle and riding on a donkey. Have you ever seen a donkey run? They can, but it's not a horse. It's slower. It didn't instruct me as such either, because for starters, Solomon didn't ride a donkey. He rode a mule. And a mule was royal, because mules were hard to come by. They're a combination of two animals that generally don't like to mix, horse and a donkey. 
And so royalty rode mules. And I got to ride a mule one time in, in uh, Yosemite. I kind of liked it. It was, it, was, it was gentle. It wasn't mean. Anyway, that's another story. But to combine those two stories, really you have a flaw. Because Solomon was riding a king's animal. Where Jesus is riding a humble donkey. They're small. No one rented a battle, I don't think, riding a donkey. They weren't very fast. Well, when people saw Jesus on the call, they understood he was the king. From this prophecy. They were looking for this prophecy. It's specific, riding on a donkey. And it goes on in 10 to say why. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He's not coming as a warrior king. He's coming as a peaceful king. And this prophecy was well known, and so they were familiar with it. But there's more. Let's read another prophecy here. Uh, Psalms, yes, yeah, Psalms 118.27. I wrote so small, I can't read it there. One eighteen twenty-seven, And I'm just going to read the last part of this. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to John, uh, Psalms 18.27. With bows, as in branches in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Now where did the story of the uh, Jesus and the triumphal entry, where did they stop? At the temple. Another prophecy being fulfilled and the people ran out and got bows to wave and to place on the ground. Another prophecy that they were familiar with. And so things, go ahead. Psalms 118, 27. The Lord is God, shining upon us, take the sacrifices, and bind it with cords on the altar. That's 118, is that what you said? 118, And what version is that? Interesting. I'm in the NIV. That's very different, isn't that's it? That's really different. Wow. Well, that's what I was reading. American Yeah. I wonder why they kept that out. I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. At any rate, there's a reason why they're cutting the boughs. It's a, it's a procession. It's a kingly procession, and they knew it. And they were welcoming their king, the son of David, into the city. We still don't know why they're calling him the son of David, though. Let's go to Micah 5.2. These are all Old Testament. Micah 5.2. These are all Old Testament prophecies, and the reason I'm in the Old Testament is because they wouldn't have the New Testament yet. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, you are small among the clans of Judah. Notice where he's coming from, Bethlehem, from the clans of Judah. Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Here we find out that he will be born in Bethlehem from the tribe of Judah. And so they knew that, son of David. What tribe was David from? Judah. Judah wasn't the oldest son, but there were a few bumps along the way with Jacob's kids, and Judah was the kingly line. So they were calling him king, and he rides in, fulfilling prophecy just the way that we find it here in the Old Testament, to the temple, exactly where they said he would go. 
And then notice at the end of the day there, go back to Mark 11. Then he went out to Bethany with the 12. This was Sunday. So he's back to Bethany. The next day, some big things happen. They start toward Jerusalem again. It's a couple of miles, maybe even less, depending on where you're at. But it's not very far. It's down in a gorge and then up the other side. Jerusalem was a temple that really was built where a fortress had been. And they see a fig tree. And apparently they haven't eaten, which makes me wonder if they weren't with Lazarus. And Jesus decides to go over to the fig tree and get something to eat. Now, how many of you are familiar with fig trees? Figs come almost as soon as leaves on fig trees. And of course, I'd rather eat a ripe fig, but if I had, couldn't find anything to eat, you could eat a fairly green fig and there's still some nutrition there. Yeah. But Jesus goes over there and even though the tree is in full leaf, and they point that out, no figs. So he does something strange. Verse 14, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. The disciples heard him say it. I think Peter, through the mouth and pen of Mark here, is the only one who mentions this story. But for Peter, this was significant. Jesus says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And that's the end of this story, right? <laughs> You're right, until the next day. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and being, began driving out those who were buying and selling there. Now, I did not know this until studying this week but they were buying and selling in a particular courtyard of the temple. Did you catch which courtyard it was? It was the courtyard of the Gentiles. You know, they're just Gentiles. What's the difference whether we have some stinky animals in that courtyard? This wasn't always the practice. Caiaphas himself, shortly before this, had been the one to instate this practice, Caiaphas. On reaching, he, he enters uh, and begins driving out those who are buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers, kind of a problem for people with their money scattering everywhere. And the benches of those selling doves, he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer? Do you know what verse he's quoting? For all nations. For all nations, right. That's true. Do you know what verse he's quoting there? He's quoting Old Testament again. Isaiah 56, 7. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And you don't catch on why he's so emphatic about all nations until you get that point. It is in the Gentile court that they are desecrating the temple. But you have made it a den of robbers. Also another Old Testament verse that he's quoting there. But we'll keep going. <laughs> The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. Now we don't know where they went out of the city till we read the next verse, but they're back in Bethany where the fig tree that had been cursed is at. But what else do you find here, what Jesus is talking about, my house will be called a house of prayer 
for all nations. Anything interesting strike you? Does it make you think prayer should be a big part of the temple service or perhaps our church service? My house should be called a house of prayer. The temple, you know that little temple model that I have of the, of the furniture and I've talked to you a couple of times about what it was about. The temple, that model, literally was about reinstating communication between sinful man and a holy God. The curtain in the temple, which represents Jesus, was as close as sinful man can get to a holy God without dying, at this moment in our lives anyway. And it was about getting back into connection with God. When the priest was outside, on the other side of that, that uh, curtain in the temple, and he was praying for the prayers of the people who were behind him outside the temple, God would get so pleased with the prayers that he would glow brighter and brighter and brighter. And as the fervency of the prayer continued, the brightness became so great, the glory of God was so strong that the priest would fear for his life on some occasions and run from the temple. Wait for the glory of the Lord to subdue a little so he could go back in and finish the prayers of the people. And I tell you this because this too should be a vital connection between man and God. Now there is no temple left on earth. You have to understand these would be more like synagogues where we do teaching and reading God's word. The only temple left is in heaven. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. And as we talk about this curse, we find from Ellen White that the fig tree was a symbol of the nation of Israel, or Judah at this point, actually. They looked pretty. They had great, big, nice, full leaves but they bore no fruit. Jesus died in 33. This would have been a, in 33 when this is happening. So we're talking, what is that, 47 years, and the curse of the fig tree would happen. The temple is destroyed by Rome and gone. Fruit, what kind of fruit is God looking for? It's <laughs> looking at some of Mrs. White's writings today. This comes from a book, CHS 87.5. I didn't look up what that book's name is. All will be justified by their faith and judged by their works. And you might think to yourself, my works are to keep the commandments of God. And yes, God does hope that you will keep those because it keeps you out of a lot of trouble. But that's not the fruit that Jesus is looking for here. He's looking for, Javier? Where is that quote from? CHS 87.5. The fruit that, that Jesus is looking for here C-H-S? is people converts. Judah was put, or Jerusalem, Israel, was put in a crossroads so they could witness to the nations, and they did not. So they were the cursed fig tree. Uh, Javier, did you get it? CHS 87.5. Temples destroyed. Notice... Or the tree was not shriveled until the night. 
Maybe it was too dark, I'm not sure. Because it does say when evening came, they went out of the city. So they're leaving in the e evening. I don't know why they didn't see it going that direction. Maybe they did. But coming back the other day, or the next day. And let's read that part, Joe, as you bring it up here. Mark 11:20. In the morning as they went along from Bethany, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Now then Jesus goes into a discourse here. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Is it that simple? Have you ever prayed to have a mountain thrown into the sea? I bet we have. Big problems in life, we pray. <laughs> Lord, take this away. <laughs> Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, then he puts a couple conditions here. And see if you can tell me why he would focus in on this condition with his disciples. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Okay, I was actually thinking of something that happened in Mark 8, not very long before this. You remember the th three disciples were up on the hill with Jesus, and he's transfigured before them. But what I want you to focus on are the disciples at the foot of the mountain. What are they doing? Well, that's where the ones on the top of the mountain were doing. Probably the ones at the bottom were too, but they're doing one more thing. They're writing about who will be the greatest? This is shortly after, is it after? Yes, I think. You can check me on this and I'm certainly not exactly sure. It's shortly be after, shortly after John and James went to Jesus and asked for positions on his right and his left. Now that wasn't quite the last week, but we're getting close. Now we're in the last week. They're still arguing, and we know that they still will be arguing about who is the greatest at the Last Supper. So, Joe, you have Judas on one side who's elbowed his way to the closest possible seat to Christ, and you have John on the other during the Last hey, Supper who's elbowed his way as close as possible to Christ. Peter asked John, ask the Master who's the one betraying him. So I felt when I read that, and this is a while back, that Peter understood that there was no special thing to John just because whatever the person was, ask him. He'll tell you. And these two disciples, one is lost forever, one changes his ways and follows Jesus. Do you know that that's, that really quit coming up, that who is the greatest thing after Jesus is uh, dead? They realized that the kingdom was very different than they expected. They realized that they were probably all headed to a martyr's death, and they all were martyred. It's just that John wouldn't die. <laughs> they tried hard, but he wouldn't die. Yeah, they, they boiled him in oil, and I guess it was just a nice cleansing skin bath or something for him. <laughs> And that's why, I mean, this is way off the lesson, but that's why I think they sent him out to Patmos. I don't think Patmos was a, was a Roman prison. 
I think it was a desert island. They dumped him off. If you can find a few fish and a lizard, that's up to you to eat. But we don't want to try to kill you because they didn't want another public display of failure on trying to kill this guy that wouldn't die in a boiling pot of oil. I think it goes beyond that, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hobby. Doesn't the lesson make it look like it was not time for pigs? I kind of got that impression. I was like, hey, why? It was a little rock on yeah, yeah, yeah. the tree part. <laughs> the lesson does make it sound, but I've watched my fig tree, and maybe California figs are different than Middle Eastern figs, but figs show up before leaves on a fig tree. They are there. It has crops, but you can almost always find some figs somewhere. Until but, they start the yeah, even like my fig tree, I think, had figs on it clear in January. It also makes you study what it is roots. I've never seen that. How can they tell? I mean, the roots are on the ground. How can they tell that the tree tree all the way to the roots? Hmm. I think the answer, Joe, is when we've tried to cut down a fig tree, bam, that thing grows. It, no, they didn't, but I, for whatever reason, it looked deader than dead to them, and I, I don't know the answer to that. But So... It's possible. I don't know uh, if he was just making an example of a of a fig tree that had done its best, but probably not. He was probably doing a rogue fig, fig tree here. Let's go on. The time is always relentless. <clears throat> Let's go to 27. Now they've they've seen the cursed fig tree. He's given them the lecture that you aren't going to get your prayers answered. If you hold grudges, at least, if you have something against someone else, and other reasons. 27, they arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority to do this? Notice they didn't ask who by whose authority? By what authority? These guys are thinking in terms of the Sanhedrin. They're thinking in terms of Caiaphas, the high priest. They're thinking in terms of their temple structure. They are definitely not thinking in terms of God's son standing before them. But they, they, they get in his face. Why, why did you do this? because he's directly challenging their service at the temple. Caiaphas' service at the temple. Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I'm in do I am doing these things. Now, why was, he, why was he coy about this? Why doesn't he just answer his qu their question? I am the Son of God. Anybody? They are because he would be committing blasphemy in their eyes, right? No human being can possibly be God. Okay. Say that again, Javier. People nowadays do that. They forgive sins and all that good stuff. 
that's not going to work out for them at the end either. <laughs> the fig tree will die. <laughs> Someone else was saying something, Lisa. So if he says, by my own authority, what will they say? Who are you? You're not even a trained rabbi. If he says he's the son of God, they stone him. So they've, they've got this brilliant trap, they think, set for him. Jesus knows what it is, so he asks them a question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. He puts them back in a trap. Now, what is the trap that he's laying for them here? And they, they outline it here. They discuss it among themselves and say, if we say from, from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? Good point. But if we say from men, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So he's got them caught. So they answered Jesus a phrase that learned doctors, these were not medical men, but doctors don't like to use. We don't know. I always feel like until I hear someone tell me they don't know something, I'm not sure if they're telling me the truth. When I finally hear them say, I don't know something, then you know, well, probably they, they're telling me the truth. Anyway, we don't know. He then launches into a parable. And as we read this parable, tell me who the players in this parable are. We're now in Mark 12. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Who's the man? God the Father. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. Who are the farmers? The religious leaders. There we go. Uh, at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect some fruit of the vineyard. Who are the servants? The prophets, or the, or the true priests, but God's people, the, the messengers. But what did they do? They seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Did not kill him this time. Then they sent another servant, another prophet, to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He then sent another, and on that day they killed him, sent, and they killed him. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. So here are the prophets. God's people, they treat them terrible. He had one left to send, a son. Who's the son? Jesus. Jesus, whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, and this is remarkable thinking here, come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. You think that the king is not gonna be annoyed when they kill the son? Kings usually come with armies. Kings usually have power. <laughs> how, do you, how do you plan to keep the deed of the vineyard you kill the, uh, the son? It, it's... So why is Jesus telling this parable with this absurd thinking in it? You're exactly right, Stan. This is their last chance. 
They think that he is the one that's in trouble, but this is their last chance. And he's exposing their insanity right here. You're gonna kill the son, and you think that's gonna work out for you? They knew exactly what he was talking about. Uh, they. Perhaps, but even the ones that didn't know before that, they knew. They knew this story was about them. So they took him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or cornerstone. The Lord has done, it, done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now notice this last 12-12 uh, here. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. He exposes to their face what they're thinking, what they're doing, and the outcome and it doesn't change their course. It's remarkable. Now, do you know what parable he's quoting from here? This is Isaiah 5. Have you ever looked at Isaiah 5? 5, 1, I think. Uh, in the middle of 5, 1, my loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it for, of stones and planted it with the choices of vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a, a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? For I looked for good grapes. Why did it yield only bad? Now I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. I will destroy it. And it goes on from there. It will be broken down. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. This is Isaiah 5. They knew very well what Jesus is quoting in Mark. And they knew that it was them he was talking about. So they look for a way to kill him. Interesting, interesting logic here. As our time goes on here, we, we have so many stories in this lesson, it's really remarkable. Uh, earthly duties and heavenly outcomes, this is Wednesday's lesson, Mark 12:13. Now they're trying to follow up through on their plan to catch him in some way to kill him. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. So they came to him and said, Teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, in other words, us, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truths. Truth, flattery, and here's the, here's the hook. So is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius, one day's wage, and let me look at it. So what is the trap here? Should we pay taxes or not? They're clever. So if Jesus says, no, you don't have to pay taxes because the Romans are conquerors and why should we pay for them to continue being able to dominate us? What's gonna happen? <laughs> the Romans aren't gonna be very happy. And when the Romans weren't happy, there was usually blood. Nobody's happy. One of the rebellions, I don't remember which of the three, they killed over half a million Jews. 
Is that the one in 70, or there's one more after 70? 135 AD, I think, is the last uh, Jewish rebellion against the Roman Empire. So the Jews rebelled a lot, and they were looking for a reason to do so, but the Romans also didn't put up with rebellion. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> so what else do you find here? If Jesus says, don't pay the tax, you have the Roman problem. If he says, pay the tax, then what are they going to accuse him of? Being in league with the Romans, the conquering power. They're clever. Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He says, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. So they bring him a, a coin, a day's wage. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is on this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and, what, and give to God what is God's. It occurs to me that uh, the controversy is mostly between the state and, and God the Father. And every time that Jesus did anything, we are told uh, to pray and the Holy Spirit will tell them what to do. And the devil will use his own, you know, uh, messengers, uh, the priest, the spirit, or whatever. So everything that happens is happening also on the spiritual realm. And I can see God and the devil doing the back and forth. And I find it incredible that the devil is trying to somehow beat God at his game of knowing the future and the past. <laughs> he knew it's like whatever the devil comes up with, the God will always have the other hand on the coin thing, as true that these guys were. You know, you can be amazed at how Jesus sold it, but I'm thinking, well, how can you beat God at his game? It's like, <laughs> So the Pharisees, now defeated, sit down. I'm not sure if they left, but probably there was nowhere to sit. But they leave. In steps the next player in the game. <laughs> then the Sadducees. And the difference between the Sadducees and Pharisees is what? One doesn't believe in the resurrection. That's the biggest one that we know of. The, the Sadducees are very wealthy also. They're the high priest family. They're not very spiritual, which you add that all together and you're baffled. Correct. They did not believe in any part of Scripture except the first five books. The Pharisees have been defeated. So they're out. Now the Sadducees come in. These are the smart guys, give or take. <laughs> who, who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they say. Now they're calling him teacher, rabbi, which is also flattery. Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. This is something we don't follow today, and I'm not really sure if they were allowing polygamy to take care of this. I don't know. There's a lot of questions in my mind here that I didn't study through, but anyway, they go on. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no children. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died. Now, they don't believe in the resurrection, but they ask him, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus' reply here is interesting. Should they have believed in the resurrection? Now, let's just pause for a moment. Is there anything from Old Testament in the first five books that would make them think possibly there's a resurrection. What about Enoch? That's a good one I didn't think about. <laughs> That's a brilliant one. Enoch didn't die. He went somewhere. Maybe they figured that doesn't count. That wasn't a resurrection. I don't know. <laughs> no. I'll give you a hint. I looked up the word resurrection 
It is never used in any Old Testament book in any of the versions that I have. But all the patriarchs believe on it. That was they were being obedient to God. Otherwise, drink wine and do whatever. It doesn't matter. So they, what they did, love God. But it was understood that they believed in the life to come. The Pharisees certainly did. But I, I couldn't get past Genesis 3.15. You familiar with Genesis 3.15? I know you are. This is the, you will crush, he, he will crush the, the woman, the church will crush Satan's head, but he will bruise your heel. Well, generation after generation of church believers have died as the bruised heel, and it would seem to me that they would have been crushed if they would have never expected a resurrection but they are bruised because the resurrection brings them back to life that's three chapters in in scripture and the Sadducees are missing it now if you go into the Psalms there's a couple more Job should we read Job now they didn't have Job but Job is they wouldn't have had Psalms either, but I'm talking about uh, the rest of the people standing there. We should read Job here for a moment. This is remarkable. Job is going through the trial of trials. Job 19.25. Job 19.25 says, I know that my Redeemer lives. God isn't, Jesus hasn't come yet. Job's faith is strong. And then in the end, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. Job believed in a resurrection. You can find it in two more places in Psalms as well as probably many others. But yes, the resurrection maybe isn't used, that word isn't used, but it is scattered throughout, as Joe is mentioning here, throughout the Old Testament. In the first five books, I probably should have focused there because that's all they had. Uh, it would have been interesting to do a more careful study. I assume they must have still been following Aaron's line. They were pretty careful with the lines, so that's why they were leadership. Jesus replied, are you not, this is back to Mark 12, 24, are you not an heir? Because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, they will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the bush how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Jesus is saying, why would God be talking about him being the God of people long dead and forgotten if there is no resurrection? You are badly mistaken. Well, we have one minute to talk about the greatest commandment. <laughs> Janine is laughing at me now because she knows I can't do this. <laughs> the greatest commandments, one of the teachers of the law. So now the next guy comes in. They are gonna catch him on something. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which one is the most important? If you had been asked that without this story, what would you have said? Which one is the most important? The most important one, Jesus answered, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus adds one to the actual verse, which is Deuteronomy 6.5, and in my minute, I don't have time for you to look it up, but you should read it. 
And then he goes to the second one, which is Leviticus 19.8. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So Jesus doesn't boil it down to one commandment, but he boils it down to two, kind of one, love. Love for God, love for your fellow man. The teacher even admits, well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. And Jesus actually says to this man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. We don't know what happens to this guy after this moment, but we'd like to believe that he saw the lamb on the cross and understood. We don't know. Well, I know that I took two minutes to talk about the greatest commandment and there's so much more we could talk about in it. But if you're battling God in some way in your heart, you won't win. Any more than these learned philosophers, teachers of the law, the high priest line, any more than they won. He gives us clear indication of how he wants us to live our lives and it's mostly for our own good. And he tells us that he wants us to be with him. I mean, that's a remarkable thing in and of itself. God himself, God Almighty wants you to be his priest in the new kingdom, the new kingdom. They're arguing about who is the greatest all humanity will be God's priests in the new kingdom. And I can only imagine we'll be kind of a celebrity in a horrible sense where everybody in the universe wants to ask us questions about the experience that we went through. I don't know if you're gonna to wanna to talk about it, but they're gonna to wanna to know what it was like. These people I call them people because I don't know what else to call them, did not understand the great controversy until they saw Jesus on the cross. And then they knew Satan was wrong. You would have thought they'd have caught on a little quicker than that, but we'll have questions to ask too. Anyway, let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you so much for these stories, there were six today, I couldn't get through them in great detail, but Lord, help them burn a, etch a memory in our mind about just following you, not, not arguing, not, not trying to get around things, but just following you. We're saved by grace, but judged by your law. And Lord, just give us peace in our hearts that your grace is sufficient for us all, no matter what we've ever done, your grace will cover it. And your Holy Spirit will change us and make us ready for that moment where either we pass from this earth or we see you come in the, in the sky. Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. Continue to bless this church service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.